Here I am. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Hi, everybody. We are here live one minute early. This is uh, a new for me to be early to my live. Um, this is Annalisa with Journey to the Goddess TV live from Greece in Athens. Here I am, my lovely little apartment here, and you can see the back patio. Um, and today I'm here with author, and I would call you a mystic, um, Krishna Rose. She wrote Woman in Red, Magdalene Speaks. So I'm really, really excited to have Krishna Rose here today to talk about her book, to talk to us about Mary Magdalene, um, and to share a little bit about her journey and give insights um, for anybody who might be curious to know who that Mary Magdalene actually was. So welcome. <laughs> welcome everybody. So lovely to be here with you, Annalise. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to give you your official introduction okay. um, before we get into the Q&A. So Krishna Rose, Oracle of the Grail, Prophet Tess, Priestess of the Magdalene. Calling the Magdalene, Krishna Rose is a leader in the field of Mary Magdalene activation, knowledge, and wisdom. Author of award-winning historical novel, Woman in Red, Magdalene Speaks, she propounds that after 30 years of research, this could be the closest to a true story of Christ you will ever witness. And I want to let people know up front, uh, in case they don't make it through the whole thing, uh, but you should, um, that you can purchase her book on Amazon, uh, Kindle, and also the, yeah, the hard copy here is fully available. And uh, those links will be available in the YouTube text box. Um, after our live through stream is finished. Uh, so let's dive in. And yeah. uh, we're going to start with actually an invocation. She's going to lead us in an invocation. Okay. So first to begin, I'm going to light some sage. I like to create sacred safe spaces when we open up for holiness, um, because this is like a a trance type experience for me. Uh, so lighting some sage in uh, your honor, in Mary Magdalene's honor and asking for the blessings of the herb to create a sacred space for us for, and for all who come across this video. Mm. So um, I would like to just share with you, there's a very beautiful um, ancient Aramaic prayer and I'm gonna sing it with you here now today as a meditation to invoke, to invoke holiness. Holy is the truth that I allow myself to embody. Just take a deep breath and allow the holiness of the ancient language of Jesus to fill you with its sacred purify, purifying power. I actually wrote a really lovely chant to Mary Magdalene that I'd love to share at some point, maybe at the end. If that's okay, that's, and that's it'll, be a, it'll be a sing-along one that we, everybody can join in. I just wanted to do a short little invocation just to call in some holiness to the space. That, that was perfect. Thank you so much oh, for setting this stage for us today. Mm -hmm. um, so let's dive in. And I want to start with, I think, maybe the most important question of all, which is mm -hmm. who is or who was or both Mary Magdalene? Yeah. So um, 
who was she not and who was she? This is a good question. So she was a princess in the lineage of Benjamin and Benjamin and David were basically cousins who have both have lineages. So of course, uh, Jesus's family um, we know comes from the lineage of David. Mary Magdalene's family came from Benjamin and these two bloodlines, they are, um, they are royal bloodlines. And so she was a princess in this lineage of Benjamin and she would have been betrothed very young, maybe eight years old to Jesus. And the reason being that these lineages of Benjamin and David, they interbred constantly. For thousands of years, they interbred to keep the bloodlines pure. So um, really, it wasn't until um, Constantine, actually, it was, it was Pope Gregory who decided that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. And he was the first one to propound that this person known as Mary Magdalene was this person that had seven devils in her that needed purifying from Jesus and uh, that she was a prostitute. And of course, in the Bible, there is no mention of Jesus's marital status, none whatsoever. It doesn't say that he was married and it doesn't say that he was not married. And mm -hmm. there's a reason for that because it was just a given that a Davidic prince, a noble lord of Jesus's status, a messiah, would be married and have children. It would have been his duty, his sacred duty to have heirs. So Mary Magdalene was the wife of Christ and she bore him two sons. She also had a daughter, Sarah Tamar, who was uh, with her first husband, John the Baptist. That is not a very well-known thing. It's something that was revealed to me when I began writing her story. So I basically, oh, I'm gonna go off on a train now, but tell me to, feel free to guide me if I go off. But basically I decided to, that if I was gonna write her story, her real story, that I would have to really know what I'm talking about because I'm, I'm a perfectionist in everything that I do. So I set about for 30 years, I read everything that there was historically on Jesus and Mary Magdalene's life. And 99% of it was not from the Bible. So what gradually began happening over that 30 years was a full picture just began to appear that something was very amiss that what we have been told as the Jesus story truth was actually filled with church propaganda and lies um, to create a male dominated religion that they were in charge of. So how they did this was by, by Pope Gregory III in the 500 years after Jesus and Magdalene's life, declaring that he was unmarried and that all men should be celibate. There was a very big and crooked evil reason for this, why the church wanted to do this. Um, when you remove everything feminine, the whole world becomes imbalanced. And um, they just, just like when they remove Mary Magdalene, they actually remove the goddess. They removed mm -hmm. everything feminine, except for Mother Mary, this unattainable woman who is perpetually a virgin. So they basically make all women into Eves and prostitutes by setting Mary Magdalene, the, the bride of Christ, aside, by removing Isis and every goddess on the planet out of the way in favor of a male-dominated religion um, that they are in charge of. They wanted the messianic throne for themselves. The Vatican Church stole it from the bloodline family of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Now, when they went after Jesus's family and Magdalene's family, they basically started a witch hunt. It was under the guise of a witch hunt. If somebody had red hair, they're a witch, they should be murdered. And, you know, truthfully, what was this really about? It began in France, predominantly it began in France. And this was all because of Pope Gregory, wanting to rid the world of Jesus's actual bloodline lineage because 
they are the grail bearers. They are the messianic crown holders, if you like. So mm-hmm. we have kings and queens in the world, but then you have a messiah who came to earth for a specific cause, um, which is he's also known as a Shakti Vesh avatar in the Vedas. So he wasn't only predicted in Judea, he was actually also predicted in India. People don't know that, but there was actually an ancient scripture called the Bhavishya Mahapurana. And in there, all the world, all the world's most important events are recorded. They were pre-recorded and written down as prophecy. So can I pause you there just for a second? Yes. Because I know that there is, and this is not talked about that often, there is like um, a temple in North India that claims to have evidence that Jesus visited that temple. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when people could actually visit, but it's closed to the public now, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does that have um, something to do with what you're talking about? um, Yes, it's, it's very much part of it because even though Christ was in India from the age of 13 to 26, he was preparing for his messianic um, duty by having the best education that he could possibly get. And of course, in India, the kings and queens in India were already connected with Christ and his family because the three kings came from India to on the behest of the astrologers to go and give alms to this new child who was born, who was the Messiah, the Shakti Vesh avatar that was also predicted in the Vedas. So they, their astrologers sent these three kings uh, from India, from the three regions of India, to go and uh, give gifts to the baby Jesus. And that's how Mother Mary got connected with the Indian kings. Um, and so the kings would have recommended that Jesus come to India for his learning because we have the most complete um, scriptures in the world are there in India. Um, the, it's the oldest language, the Sanskrit language, the Vedic scriptures are massive. So it would have made sense that he would have gone there, put it this way. And so, how did you, how did you come across that link? Um, well, I was actually in India. I, actually, when I was eight years old to get back to the tomb in, in India. So where do I begin? When I was eight years old, I was taken to the tomb of Jesus, where his body is said to be buried. And there's a facade at the top of, you see a coffin uh, covered with a Jewish robe and Christian symbols all over. And uh, um, the imprints of his feet where you can see the raised uh, bumps on his feet where he had scar tissue from the crucifixion is there. His walking cane that he walked with is there um, because he was a cripple for the rest of his life. His wounds didn't never heal. And um, he, after after the resurrection, when they fled, Judea. Um, to begin with, they went into the mountains of Egypt to Sketis, where they lived with a therapeutic to get healed, just so that he could recover sufficiently enough that they could take a boat ride to France. So after a year of them healing and resuscitating Christ from his ordeal, which was extreme, um, people have this imagination that because he, you know, they, they, they put Jesus on this status as a God, God-like figure that he could just heal himself, you know, well, healers often don't heal themselves. Right. I just want to say too, you've revealed like a big revelation that's in the book that mm-hmm. he, um, that I actually haven't gotten to that part yet, but that mm-hmm. he survived is what you're saying. Yeah. He survived yeah. the crucifixion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, when he rose, when Thomas saw him and didn't believe that he was seeing the risen Christ, he asked him, you know, you're a, you're a ghost, you're a spirit. And Jesus said, I am not touch me, touch my wounds, sup with me, eat with me. I am real. I am mm-hmm. as real as you are. And so this is evidence that Christ was not, you know, a lot of Christians come at me with this, you know, that no, he, he rose in the spirit, that that was his resurrection. Well, that's not a resurrection. We all we all become spirit when we die. That's not a resurrection. A resurrection is that you actually come back into the body and perform a miracle. And he did that. He did it because he wanted to glorify God. And he wanted to, to for the message of God's kingdom to span the centuries. And so he knew he had to do something very extreme. 
and he did it. He performed the miracle of returning to life with God's help. And, you know, he went on to live a, a very long life in India, in fact. After France, he went off to India because he, part of the Messiah's duty was to find the lost tribes of Judea and reunite them and re-inspire them with their own faith, which is divine love. So when Jesus went through the gypsy trail from France to Kashmir, India, he traveled. That's when he met Saul in Turkey and Ephesus because Mother Mary wanted to stay in Ephesus. There's a whole amazing story that's in my book about how they traveled through the gypsy road and the Silk Road, the gypsy trail. And a lot of information was given to me when I was in India. I was living with, uh, with a pure saint in India for a while in, in his temple. And he revealed a lot of things about Christ's life in India that I did not know. I was still a young lady and I wasn't planning on even writing a book about Jesus then, but he inspired it in me um, by telling me things that were unknown about Jesus. And in fact, my teacher went to that place in Hemis that you're talking of. It's actually a Buddhist monastery. And mm -hmm. these monks have been living there for, you know, 4,000 years. It's in a place called Ladakh. It's literally in the middle of nowhere on top of a mountain. It's very, very difficult to get there. But Jesus came there to see the Buddhist monks because he made friends with the Buddhists when he was on the gypsy trail. And um, he promised them that he would come to Hemis because there was a prophecy that their reincarnated Dalai Lama would be coming at that time. So the Buddhists believed that Jesus was their re reincarnated Dalai Lama. Interesting. So when he stayed there, the, the, everything that he spoke, they recorded, they wrote down on scrolls that are still in the cellars today of that. But did, he, did he also learn from them? Or was yeah, it, it was both. Sure? Of course, yeah. it's both. He's the master, but the ma even when you're a master, you're still learning. So, right. yeah, you never stop learning and experiencing and sharing that love, you know, that wisdom. But every every teaching, every miracle, all about his healing and his wounds and everything was all there written in the scrolls. And my teacher actually was taken to Hemis when he was younger. And he would, because he's a saint, he was taken down into the cellars and he was shown the scrolls. And they, wow. they read the scrolls to him and he heard these original teachings that were Jesus. And he told me personally, this was definitely Christ. He fulfilled the prophecy by going there because he was their Dalai Lama reincarnate. And he was the Shakti Vesh avatar that the Vedic scriptures said would come to Kashmir after being uh, risen from the dead fulfilling the prophecy so he had to do all of these things it was prophecy but apparently he lived there till he was 78 and his tomb is still there these scrolls are still there in Hemis Moses is also buried in Kashmir and wow. Kashmir there's a where Moses is buried it's in a place called the valley of the gods and the valley of the gods in ancient scripture is the um the promised land it's the promised land that was spoken of in the Bible. So it's no, it's, it's no wonder that Moses went there and lived there and died there. And then of course, Jesus would have gone. Okay. So lot, lots of stuff, <laughs> lots of really interesting stuff to unpack yeah. here. Now, because I haven't gotten all the way through the book yet, mm -hmm. I'm sorry about this question. And if you don't want to reveal this, it might be secret um, <laughs> in terms of like, people just need to read it for themselves in your book. Mm. But obviously a lot of people think that um, Mary Magdalene and maybe Jesus, since there are legends of Jesus being in France too, went to France after the crucifixion and then died and taught there. Mm -hmm. Is that congruent with the storyline that you're presenting? Yeah, absolutely. They did, they went to France and uh, there were many tribes, Judean tribes that have fled Judea living in the South of France at that time. So they, uh, they were taken by Joseph of Arimathea on a boat to the south of France, where they were integrated into the region that is now known as St. Maxime, I guess. It was mm -hmm. named after Maximus, who was uh, Joseph of Arimathea's right-hand man. And he became the first minister, I guess, of St. Maxime. He was the first church bearer in France. 
um, and they lived there for a while. There were some Essenes who were living in the countryside, more inland from St. Maxime, and that's actually where they settled. Now, later on, she left this area completely and went up into the caves to go live in the cave and become an ascetic. At that time, Jesus was in India. Christ, at some point when he was sufficiently recovered in the south of France, became, uh, what's the right word? I don't want to use the wrong word here and say he was agitated. He was agitated to go and continue his mission. Mm -hmm. He couldn't just he was getting depressed just be, just being living at, he felt that urge I've got to go preach you know yeah mm -hmm. so um so he wanted to go so that's when they went on the gypsy trail up to Kashmir and that was a that took them about a year and a half to travel the gypsy trail and the whole family went with them except for brother James who remained in Jerusalem running the church on their behalf so now let's um, back to Mary Magdalene for a second and her, not just her role as priestess mm. um, and teacher herself, which is mm -hmm. really important. We can get that to that in a minute, but mm. what would you, okay. There's, this is kind of a two part question. Like we're talking about not only the role of the divine feminine, um, which creates balance in the cosmos and balance here on earth. Mm -hmm. but also and the absence of her and purposeful suppression of the divine feminine through the you know submissiveness or the um suppression of mary magdalene um mm -hmm. as an important figure what would you say given that what would you say to people who really feel like attached to the idea of jesus as like a god without a spouse without <laughs> Oh, great question. <laughs> well, you know, look, at the end of the day, whether he was married or not, it really honestly doesn't matter. His message is what he came to bring. His teachings, his ways, his um, gift to humanity, if you like, the compassion that he's taught us and shown us how to live. And Mary Magdalene embodied his teachings better than anybody. She is the embodiment of his teachings and we are extensions, we are extensions of her grace. So Mary Magdalene's importance is unsurpassed and very underrated in spiritual circles, if I'm really honest. I, when I began writing their story, um, it, it was really a channeled trance language experience for me. I would... Mary Magdalene would basically take over. And at times I would feel Jesus just take over my hands and write their story through me. And I was just witnessing it through my third eye. So I was writing all their conversations, um, but their conversations were confirmed in the, in the, in the Gnostic Gospels. And, and the conversations that weren't written down, I had to present them in a very authentic way that that, you know, it doesn't sound biblical because, you know, when you're behind closed doors and you're just talking husband and wife, you're just talking. And people say to me, well, you know, that wasn't written in the Bible. Well, there's lots that wasn't written in the Bible. I mean, you know, they've only recorded, you know, maybe a total of 18 hours of his life. I mean, he had an entire life. Conversations were, were, were everywhere, left, right and center. So, we should try to imagine what kinds of amazing conversations he was having behind closed doors well, with Magdalene. And that's one of the points that I wanted to bring up today is that you really provide us with a really a deeply rich and lively experience of what her inner thought processes and world would have been like and interactions with the people around her. And I, I thought that that really, mm -hmm. I don't know, gave me a new just a new impression of Mary Magdalene, but I, I didn't even same. know I needed. Yeah, I, I didn't even, I didn't know what to expect when I started on this journey. I just knew that I was called spiritually, like dharmically, to correct these wrongs of history and religion because I am a goddess worshiper. I mean, I, I, I love God in masculine and feminine equally but I'm slightly more in love with the goddess 
um, I'm a daughter of the goddess, I would say. Yes. So, so healing this rift of Jesus's marriage was very important to me because the goddess and everything feminine was set aside through this fake news propaganda of the church that he was unmarried. So to get back to the question of like people who believe and need to believe that Jesus was unmarried, never had children, go ahead. If, if that's what spark, if that's what sparks your fancy, then go for it. You know, that the bottom line is, is that he was married and they did have children, but people are going to believe whatever they are going to believe. I don't need anybody to believe it. That's up to them. But Regardless of whether they believe that or not, the teachings are alive in my book. Mm -hmm. I feel very, very proud of this body of work that was created through my body for their benefit and for the benefit of everybody, because I feel like I took the words of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, in, especially from her gospel. I literally sat with her gospel for a year. and. Every morning I would read passages from her gospel and then I would spend, you know, two, three hours praying. And at the end of a year, her gospel completely unlocked and decoded and opened up to me. I completely <clears throat> understand what she was trying to communicate. And so that scene in the book where she goes to Peter's house and repeats the entire gospel, I get to use Mary Magdalene's actual words, but explain it in a way that we as modern English speakers can actually understand, tangibly understand. Now, if somebody picks up these Gnostic gospels and starts reading them, a lot of it's very cryptic. It's under lock and key. Like you just need to be that kind of person. I happen to be that kind of person who could do that because I like to pray and fast and live a very right. that, that spiritual life. Right. They're really a lot of the Gnostic texts are advanced teachings. Yeah. You know, it's like what we have as the New Testament. Those mm. are mostly texts for the regular lay people, basically. And if you want yeah. a deeper spiritual experience, you go to the mm. Gnostic texts. I would definitely agree with you there. I think that, you know, I think the Christ teachings have been very watered down in the, in the, in the new Testament. Um, I think that Christ as a personality is even watered down. And certainly the women of the Bible have been pretty much annihilated. If not watered down, they're annihilated. Their characters, their power, their shiny is completely not there. And that was a, a cruel swipe of the Vatican church that I am very passionate about writing. And mm -hmm. this was the sole reason for me writing my book. The sole reason. Wow. I want to bring up um, a line that's in the gospel of Mary Magdalene that came to me during meditation the other day. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was in the text, but I couldn't remember which gospel it was in. Mm -hmm. And so, and it comes up in other gospels, but phrased a little bit differently. So it's something like um, where the heart is, there is the treasure. Yeah. And I wonder if you could um, just kind of expound what that means to you or what you feel like it meant to them when she said Absolutely. It. Absolutely. I would love to do that on their behalf. So Jesus was a lover of God. He was a true devotee a pure devotee, someone whose entire being was so deeply imbued in humble reaching for the divine uh, that he embodied and led and showed by his example to everybody else who was around him. The heart is where God lives inside of us. It's described in the Vedas that when we are created, every living being, a piece of God goes, and it's called Paramatma. So a piece of God goes into the heart with every soul, into every body and every life, and just waits for that soul to turn around and notice that he's there, that God is there, that the kingdom is there. So when Magdalene and Jesus, the predominating theme of everything that they spoke about and embodied 
is this enlightenment, this liberation from our suffering through eternal realization of who we actually are in the kingdom. And that is found in meditation when we unite the mind and the heart, like she speaks of in the Gospel of Mary. She speaks of uniting the heart and the mind. So what Jesus means by this is that the mind is so powerful that where we place it, we're going to have a certain type of experience. So if you place it on TV, you're going to have one experience. If I place it on my cell phone and I'm scrolling through TikTok, it's going to be another kind of experience. But if I pick up my beads and I begin to pray, I'm directly connecting with God, with God's friends and family and the kingdom. Slowly in that process, as we start to purify our consciousness with God's mercy and grace through holy name or through our practices, the kingdom is revealed to us and it's revealed in the heart. So it starts with the mind fixing itself on God. Oh, Lord, oh, lady, I wish to see you with my eyes. Show me, reveal to me your world. Who am I in front of you eternally? What is my eternal service? How do I please you, Lord? And Jesus was embodying this prayerful, compassionate life like nobody. I mean, I, I've never, I, I'm sure I was around Jesus. So I'm very confident when I say that I was there, I, I know that I've witnessed it. And um, I couldn't have written the book the way that I did if I hadn't have witnessed it. And if I wasn't there at that time, I'm sure I was. But if I wasn't there at that time, then I was there during the writing of the book. Mm -hmm. But um, the heart is where the kingdom is. And it's something that we need to realize. It's not something that the outside world can help us with. We have to close our eyes to the world and its constant demands, to our ego and its constant demands, to our senses and their constant demands. And this was what Jesus and Mary Magdalene embodied. I mean, look at how she lived in the caves naked, naked. Mm -hmm. Even in winter, she didn't put clothes on. She wanted to be naked before God. Mm. It's so beautiful. It's astoundingly beautiful. She's my biggest inspiration. Yes. Now, thank you for sharing that. That was really, um, that really that gave me a deeper understanding of that, <laughs> of that phrase. Um, and let's go back to the Mary Magdalene goddess connection, divine feminine connection for a minute. Mm. Can you, yeah, can you kind of describe what her connection is to the divine feminine and or goddess? Well, we're all connected to the divine feminine, whether we know it or not. We're created of her divine essence. So it's described that when God created everything, it was his desire to have relationships with lots and lots of unique, different beings. But it was her Shakti. It was her who birthed all of creation. In fact, it was her inspiration, her Shakti. So we're all we're all connected to the divine feminine. She's our eternal mother and he's our and, eternal father. And I just want to clarify Shakti being like life force, energy, power. Yes. That's yes. It's feminine. It's feminine power. And the soul is made of feminine power. It's Shakti. It's, it's feminine. Our energy, our soul is made of feminine energy, feminine mm -hmm. frequency. So Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, her devotion to her husband and to his ways was unsurpassed. There was no one who walked and breathed Christ's teachings as well as she did. She embodied what he said. She led by her example, and she still leads by her example today. And... Um, I forgot where I was going now. See, that's what I do. I just go off on a tangent. What I know. I distracted you with the Shakti question too. Um, yes, no, I was asking about the, 
the connection between Mary Magdalene and the Divine Feminine? Okay, so the biggest connection to Mary, with Mary Magdalene and the Divine Feminine that I see in today's world is that she, there's a prophecy that says that when the lost bride of Judea is restored to her husband's side, that the world will be restored to peace. That the whole world will be restored when Mary Magdalene is returned to her husband's side. Mm. That this wound that we inflicted on Christ and have held there as a wound for the last 2,000 years by saying that he was not married and had no children, it is a wound to a king. Think about what Henry VIII tried to do to have sons, to have heirs. Think about it. This is the mentality of kings. They are born with this need to produce heirs. People don't understand this. It would have been ridiculous. He would have been laughed out of the temples if he was unmarried. Right. And, uh, and if he was a rabbi, a rabboni, he, had to, yeah. that he also would have been required to be married and, and people, in order. To- yes, absolutely. Now, people use the Essenes as an excuse for why he wasn't married. They say, well, he was an Essene. He was not an Essene. He was influenced by the Therapeutae, who were a branch of the Essenes who lived in Egypt, in Scetis. He was very influenced by them because his mother was very influenced by them. They lived there. They were there when he was a child, when they fled Judea, and they went there after the crucifixion to heal, to, to the Therapeutae. Now, the Therapeutae were married and they revered women, and women were encouraged to preach and to heal and to be masters, of, to be their own master. And Jesus had this mentality. He was not an Essene, I can tell you. The Essenes do not have respect for the feminine. I'm sorry, they don't. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a fact. It's a fact. I don't care what anybody says. Defeat even trying like, to me. <laughs> even like the the calf. I, I mean, some of what I've read about the Cathars very topically, like didn't like they saw the material world as sinful, and mm. I think some of them believed that Mary Magdalene was the concubine, the consort, basically, but not in like an affirmative, positive way. I mean, my understanding with the Cathars. And with French Grail history is that most people understood that they were married Mm -hmm. and most of the rituals and ceremonies that people were doing behind closed doors um, who were connected with the Christ family or people who were protecting the bloodline uh, like the Templars and such. They knew that Mary Magdalene was was married to both John and Christ. And this is why she's depicted in paintings with a skull on her lap or her feet, because it's John's head the head of the Baptist it's her first husband I think I read you I saw that you had said that before that's yeah. interesting that's interesting. yeah and the reason why she was married to John is because Jesus left for India when he had his bar mitzvah after he had his bar mitzvah age 13 he disappeared he went to India to go and study with the kings in Jagannath Puri and there's all the evidence of him being there in Puri for all of those years And in Judea, those are the missing years. So what was Mary Magdalene supposed to do? Her father would have immediately arranged for her to be betrothed to the next living relative, male relative closest in age, and that would have been John. Well, and I think it's the, I double checked this last time we had our Mary Magdalene conference, the uh, Manicheans, I believe is how Mm -hmm. you say their name. They Mm -hmm. believe that Mary Magdalene was married to John the Baptist. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's like, even though there's no actual evidence for it, I feel like I was shown that this is the truth. I I, I would say I say I say it with absolute confidence that they were married, yeah. and she was very reluctantly married to John. Very sure. reluctantly, she didn't sure. like him at all. She was in love with Jesus since she was a little girl. You know what's interesting? There's, um, do you know Rupert Sheldrake? Do you know of him? Name he's a biologist. Up. He's like okay. a, he's a rogue biologist. He's written mm-hmm. a lot about morphic resonance and he, I watched a talk of his recently. He's in his eighties. Um, but he talked about being a Mary Magdalene devotee. And mm-hmm. interestingly enough, he says in this talk that he believes that John the Baptist was actually inducing near death experiences in people when he would baptize them. Interesting. Yes. And I thought that is interesting. That's how you're inducing the spiritual awakening. I mean, you know, I, I, I believe that John was very powerful. 
and very rebellious and very outspoken and somewhat crazy at times. And mm-hmm. I got, I got, well, that's fam- pretty crazy to like yeah. almost drown people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's quite possible. It's possible. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't, I didn't see that when I was uh, witnessing the baptisms. I didn't see that. But um, I have a love hate relationship with John the Baptist after writing my book, <laughs> to be honest, because I really learned and I really, uh, even though I have so much honor and respect for him as John the Baptist, um, I had this, you know, because of my connection with Mary Magdalene, I felt very protective over her and very angry at the way that she that she was treated by him right that makes sense. I totally I totally understood why Salome did the dance with John's head <laughs> that's oh, interesting that's, that's a again. conversation for another time probably yes <laughs> um um okay let me just make sure I'm not missing any other juicy questions here and we can keep going what are some of the most Okay, yeah. So what what would you say are like some of the most surprising details about Mary Magdalene and Jesus's life that you reveal through this book? I mean, I think the whole book, the whole their whole story is a revelation. Uh, because true. the lie, yeah, I mean the lies that we've been told, and they are lies, they're propaganda, fake news propaganda. It's been around a hell of a long time. Fake Me news too. is well, not, it's not a new for thing. What, for what reason? I would say to control people, but what what would you say? It's it's always for control. It's always to manipulate uh, for the for the for the benefit of those that want to lead and take all the money and worshippers and all of that. You know, but, but it's always about that. It's always been about followers and money, hasn't it? And uh, this is why Jesus, everything he did, he did for free, and he's always told us to follow in his footsteps. That everything we should do, we should do for free because it comes from God. We are, we are not important. We're just the givers. And, mm-hmm. you know, Jesus, Jesus and Magdalene, they embodied that yeah. beautifully. And they show, they, they want all of us to be their arms and legs, to, to keep giving this mercy and this compassion and this kindness that whatever we receive in the form of knowledge or spiritual experiences, that we, we not be miserly about it, that everywhere we go, we have an opportunity to help to heal, to uplift, to bless, to give benefits to other people. Everywhere we go, we should have that attitude. Mm-hmm. I love that. Mm. And so if somebody, um, let's say someone reads your book and they're just, they're just so filled with like the spirit or the fire of Mary Magdalene, like what mm-hmm. would you suggest they do next? How could they continue a devotional relationship with Magdalene? Um. Oh, that's such a great question. And it's so loaded. Well, uh, Mary Magdalene inspired me to write a course. Actually, it was going to be a book. It's called The Dance of the Seven Veils. Um, So The Dance of the Seven Veils was an ancient rite of passage that women would go through. It wasn't actually a dance. It was a journey through the seven chakra systems um, where you untie yourself, unshackle yourself from Mm -hmm. every lower addiction that is preventing you from ascending so I put together um, it it ended up becoming a course rather than a book Uh, and it's called the dance of the seven veils and I've released it and it's only five dollars it took me about two years to put this course together Only five dollars that's it I wanted to make it free I wanted to make it free because I don't want to get I don't want to charge anybody for anything I ever do but uh, the platform that it's on requires a minimum of five dollars, so that's what it is. But it's a fantastic course, fully inspired by Mary Magdalene. And this is there's fourteen chapters towards the end of the book, um, where Mary Magdalene is taken on this dance of the seven veils, where she enters into first of all she enters into the seven hells. So the seven hells are the place where you see how the soul has shackled itself to sin or to sinful mentalities that cause not only suffering to others, but cause suffering to us in the future. So as messianic guide, the tower, the watchtower, the light tower, a light tower warns of impending doom. 
don't go, don't go that way. You're going to end up dashed on the rocks. Don't go that way. You'll be drowned if you go that way. So this is what a lighthouse does. And her name, Magdalene, means light tower. Why? Because she's holding the lamp for all of us, saying, this way, people. Mm -hmm. We have to overcome all of our lower nature in order to enter the kingdom and attain our highest nature, our eternal nature. Who we are when you're standing in front of God and goddess. Who are you at that point? What is your personality? What do you look like? Where do you live? What is your service? What are you going to do? And when you're standing in front of them, what do you want to say to them? We have to forge a relationship with divinity where we start to think of their world as being more important than this world. That where we start to think that their, that God's, um, when I speak of God, I say feminine and masculine. But when, when we think of serving God or loving God, that that is the only religion. Divine love is the only religion. And that's what Jesus and Mary Magdalene taught. They didn't come to teach that people only be this religion. Now they're only going to be Christian. You're only going to be a Jew. The Messiah came to break down all of those walls to show that love, kindness, compassion, goodness, and devotion to the divine in any name and in any language should always be welcomed. So, you know, when I see a Muslim bowing down on a prayer rug five times a day, praying to Allah, it makes me incredibly happy. I feel joy in my heart to see anybody loving God, making an effort to reach for the divine makes me happy. I don't feel threatened. We shouldn't need anybody to think like we do or to believe like we do. The only true religion is love. Totally agreed. Totally mm. agreed. And I, and, I totally you know, went off again. See? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, it's actually a really good point though. And like, you only have to, too, if people need more proof, you just watch the testimonies of people who have had near death experiences from all oh, cultures, yeah. all religions. Totally. And so many of them come back and say very similar things. And like love is the, the only thing you experience there. And light is love. It was, um, it was fascinating that you said that about the, about people who had uh, near death experiences, because I actually listened to over a thousand NDEs testimonies i listened to over a thousand before writing my seven heavens and seven hells part in the book mm. because i wanted a very clear image i got the vedic scriptures which have a very um full description of every hell and every heaven that's ever existed um very detailed descriptions are there in the Sri bhagavatam so i used that we also used uh, Dante's Towering Inferno, little bits from there that were very good, um, and the Divine Comedy, of course. Um, but a lot of what was revealed in her journey through those seven chakras, it's so transformative that I, I, I will be so bold as to declare that anybody who reads those 14 chapters will be transformed and will never be the same again anyone who reads those 14 chapters within wow. my book. Wow. Because everything that Mary Magdalene wants the world to overcome and know is there in that, in those 14 chapters. Yay. It's an ascension plan. It's an activation that can show people how to positively overcome their addictions and positively place their head at God's feet and make that the pro that instead of having your mind going here there and to all these things that cause suffering to us that the minute you put your mind on god and you remember to put your mind in god and your heart there that everything becomes okay you you transcend all your problems and right. this because is, where the heart is there is the treasure and that's it that's <laughs> it's so simple and we just complicate everything. We complicate everything. And so does it matter if people believe that Jesus and Mary are married or not? Absolutely not. Just so long as they're able to, what they can gain from my book, people who have that kind of skeptical um, inability to see the truth, that's okay. Because the teachings are that are in here, 
are so profound and so they, they, my hand was fully guided by Christ when I wrote this book. There's no question about it. This Jesus is all over this book. This is this is a manifestation of my love for him. This whole book. I could oh. cry. I'm oh. so proud. I'm, I'm so proud of it because it's an ascension tool. It yeah. really genuinely has all of the Vedic scriptures, all of the Puranas, all of the, the bi biblical scriptures. Every ancient scripture around the world is represented here in this book. All Everything you need to know to transcend and liberate yourself from suffering and struggle is in this book. And it's an expression of your utmost devotion. It's definitely, uh, it was a labor of love. <laughs> it was now my service. And let me ask you a question. A lot of people, well, whatever, a lot of people in the, maybe the new age spiritual community will say that or believe that maybe Mary Magdalene was the feminine Christ, like yeah. the feminine side of Christ. Would you mm -hmm. call her that? Yeah, absolutely. Color Messiah. Okay. So okay. that is, that's probably the biggest revelation in my book is that actually there were two messiahs who were expected at that time. People don't know this. In Judea and Rome and Greece and Turkey and India, they were all expecting two messiahs. So people believe John the Baptist was the first and Jesus was the second. But John the Baptist didn't fulfill prophecies. He didn't. And he's not the first messiah. The first messiah was Jesus and the second messiah is Mary Magdalene. She is the feminine Christ. She has fully embodied his teachings, his ways, his wisdom. And she now, at this time right now, where she is now returning and restoring herself, restoring her true glory as the bride of Christ. How is she returning herself? Um, well, I mean... Just if you just look at the last 50 years, how much information has come out about, about ma evidence of Magdalene's and Jesus's marriage. So just for example, like, so we have the Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci Code, code sold more books than the Bible. Whoa. Okay. I don't think people realize that, but the Da Vinci Code is the biggest selling book of all time. Now, why? Because... People are fascinated by secrets, secret wisdom, secret history, what really happened behind the closed doors. This is why people like watching franchises like Beverly Hills Housewives and they want to know all the gossip <laughs> and see what's really going on behind closed doors. You know, we're, we're curious beings. It's, it's natural for us to be curious. And my book allows anybody who loves Jesus uh, or Mary Magdalene it, this book allows them to get closer to these great personalities because they're all over the book there. When I wrote this book, I felt like I was with them the whole way, all the way through from beginning to end. And it, when I stopped writing, it was painful because I didn't want to lose touch with them. So to answer your question, how does one maintain devotion to Mary Magdalene and Jesus? Well, it's very simple by, by living how they would want you to live by following their example, by embodying their example, and by worshipping God and loving God how they did in whatever language and religion that may be. And one way that I personally love to connect to Mary Magdalene is through song. So this might be a good time. Can I sing? Yes, this would be a perfect time. Okay. Okay. So this is a what this is a lovely chant that came to me, and it's uh, partially in Aramaic and um, Islam Lech Maryam. So this is a prayer to invoke Mary Magdalene. So feel free to chant and sing along with me for a little while. And this is one way that if you really feel like you want to connect to the energy and frequency and um, wisdom of Mary Magdalene, then this is a great chant for that. Shlom le. Maria Shlom Leich Maria
Mary So it really is that simple. As soon as we sing the names of these great personalities, they become, they come to us. I, I was going to say, I actually felt her presence come into the, here with me. Totally. And, yeah. and you know, she, she really, Mary Magdalene is an ascension energy. She, her whole vibration is all about lifting humanity into the golden age during this time so when you said what is her connection to the divine feminine i didn't get to finish let me just go back to that because it's so important i believe that she is the color messiah the feminine christ the feminine half of the messiah of the messianic mission her body her her being is so devoted to ensuring the purity of christ's message be retained that during this time that we're in right now she is here to help us to return the divine feminine into the hearts of every living being and this restoration is what has been prophesied as being the medicine that will bring peace back on earth why because the feminine divine, she has no wish for wars and murder and control and money and greed and lust and all of these things that have become the center of how we live as a society now. Our entire society runs on those things, on the sins, not the virtues. So she created this course through me to help people overcome this mentality so that they can come back into their sacred center. It's only $5. That's how, one way that people can keep, um, keep their connection after reading the book and keep ascending. And once, that, once they've gone through that, hopefully my third book, my, my book will be ready. It's called The Secrets in the Mirror. And The Secrets in the Mirror has also been written by Mary Magdalene. I guess she's ascended through me. Um, to take people to the next level of realization of how embodying the divine feminine is the greatest archetypal healing um, that is available to us at this time. Men because, and women. Yeah, absolutely. Because anybody who opens up their heart to the divine, the minute that we add the feminine to the worship, um, everything becomes so much sweeter and softer because Divine Mother, she gives us acceptance. She, what does Mother give? You, you feel safe with Mother. You want to be embraced by Mother. You want to be held by Mother. You want to feel her protection around you all the time. And so if Mary Magdalene can help restore Divine Mother in, uh, in all religious beliefs around the world, then that's what she wants. And that, that was really her driving force behind everything that that she's asking me to do is to deliver this message that the divine feminine's return must be installed in every heart at this time if we are to move into the golden age because the divine feminine softens everything mm. i actually think that that's the perfect place to end our conversation it's just like 
a beautiful little just a little message grail. from from the <laughs> yeah little prayer <laughs> to us a little grail. Um, so, um, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we close down here? Yes. So, um, since we are embodying Mary Magdalene and Jesus's or Yeshua's uh, compassion and remembering that that's what they're asking of us. I'd just like to end today with a little blessing and a prayer um, so that anybody who uh, comes across this video can receive a blessing and uh, my well wishing. So just take a moment and just close your eyes, bring your hands into prayer position and just let go of all of your troubles, all of your problems for one moment, just all of your thoughts, just let them go and just become fully present with your breath, with divine spirit within and with divine mother and father, our creators, who we bow before, we prostrate ourselves before, and we beg for their mercy to fill us. We beg for their mercy to protect us during these uncertain times, and we ask to be guided to all the right places, people, and things. We ask for peace in our hearts, in our minds, and in the collective. And we pray for peace in our war-torn world. We pray for our leaders that their evil shall have no hold over the innocent. And we pray for divine mercy at this time that every living being be filled with the divine love, light frequency and vibration of Mother Divine who is restored and returned to the hearts of every living being. And this restoration we do in Mary Magdalene's name, the color Messiah of our time. And I wish to thank you all very much for coming and being part of this lovely sacred space with Annalisa and I, and I hope we get to do this again. I do too. And I have to say Ave, Ave Magdalena um, as my little, um, you know, end note to that beautiful I character. Love that. I, I love that. I, let me give credit where credit's due. Dr. April Heeslip, a friend of mine, <laughs> brought me onto that phrase. That is beautiful, um, and I am going to use that. Okay, good. Also, um, so when you when you can, which would be great if you could do that now. <laughs> yeah, hilarious. I'm like, like I'm <laughs> signing off on an email. When you can, can you please, um, you know, can you please let everybody know um, once again where they can find your book and your courses, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, my what's available from through me is at krishnarose.com. So my name is Krishna Rose. So it's just my website. And I have a bi-monthly uh, newsletter that's called the Oracle of the Grail, um, which Mary Magdalene shares her wisdom through. And um, that's free. And that's available to sign up through my website. The course is also available on my website. It's called the Dance of the Seven Veils. It's only $5. I'm not doing it to make any money. I'm doing it as a sharing of um, love for all living beings who are suffering and struggling so much during this time and I want to help in any way I can and so I was inspired to put that together my book woman in red magdalene speaks is available on amazon.com and it's in an ebook form and the audiobook is finished I'm just waiting for the publishers to 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 get it released but it's very okay. very beautiful the audiobook's like beautiful um and it's available, it should be available all over the world on amazon.com. And uh, I am hoping that this book reaches uh, all the right hearts, all the right people at the right time. Mm, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. <laughs> well, thank you again so much. And um, to everybody at home, please like, please leave a comment, please share. Um, Christian Rose, I believe you also have a YouTube channel, so go check out her YouTube channel mm -hmm. as well. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And um, really, uh, this has been such a pleasure for me. So thank you once again. And me too, Annalisa. You're such a love. It's just such a pleasure to spend time with you, sweetie. Oh, thank you. Well, you stay on for a minute while we well okay. we off to everybody else. Uh, so everybody at home, thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Ciao.